afternoon, everyone. I'm Willie from 3TAP. We are an independent foundry based in Shanghai, China. Uh, please take a look at the speaker's page and tell me what you find. Well, I can't help but notice that I'm the only guy here who is slanted. <laughs> or to put in typographic terms, italic. I didn't mean to italicize myself. It's just a coincidence. But my picture fits my topic today. Anyways, let's talk about italics and Chinese. As Xiao Yu from Han Yi told us this morning, uh, to build bridges between Chinese and Latin, and I'm doing this now. Italic is a common type style of the Latin font. You can say that to some degree, there is relative success with the italicization of, ma of other major non-Latin scripts, Greek, Cyrillic, and even Arabic and Thai. You deal with the slanting direction and find an optimizing solution to fit in both function and style. But the gigantic elephant in the room is Chinese. Hanzi, or Chinese characters, or kanji, hanja, or CJKV ideographs are so different from Latin letters or any other alphabetic script that when developing a multi-script international font family, Chinese or Japanese is always the toughest one to deal with. That's not only because in East Asia we have a huge number of glyphs, just as Jeff Wu from Arctic just showed you, but also because Hans' complex structures and unique aesthetics, they don't translate well to other scripts and styles. So what if we want to italicize Hans? Well, it's pretty simple. We start our word processing application, select our characters, and click this button. It's done. So now this everything can be done with just one click and italicizing Chinese, no problem. So that's all of my speech. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. <laughs> but wait a minute. Let's give it a second look. It doesn't seem right, huh? A mathematical slanting is always not, right, not the right way, especially for Chinese. But why? Has the Chinese characters ever been italicized? What does it mean when we say to italicize Chinese? Can it be italicized? Does it really need to be italicized? To get, uh, today I'm going to get to these questions. In the Latin calligraphic and typographic tradition, the Italic script emerged during the Italian Renaissance from a semi-cursive, slightly tilting hand. The Italic type has distinctive letter forms typically narrower in width and more simplified in structure than Roman. It has features, features closely related to fast, continuous writing, such as the one story A and the swashy F with a tail. There were no fixed ways to use the italic type in the beginning, and its popularity had ups and downs throughout history. It is only in the recent centuries that rules began to be established. Italics are today predominantly used along with the Roman type to emphasize, to quote, to set foreign words, preparatory names, jargons, and terminologies, and so on. To help, to help our analysis, I'm going to draw two sets of genes out of italic type. The first one is a slanting gene that controls the degree and direction of slant. The second one, the running or cursive gene that brings in all the handwritten textures. Together, voila, they give us italics. We all know that in modern Latin typography, Roman and the Italic make a sweet couple. So sweet that they usually appear built in in one typeface. Such companionship can't be found in Chinese yet. What we have in Chinese today is four brothers who don't really talk to each other. Song, Hei, Fang, and Kai, each representing a visually separate style. When I said they don't talk to each other, I mean they are not interdependent, and each works by itself. You can't find any of these brothers bundled up in a single font. First, look at this two. Song and Hei. 
In practice, they are commonly known as and used as the Chinese serif and sans serif. Similar to their counterparts in Latin, Song is often used for text and He for display. Nowadays, more and more used for, for screen. In comparison, the rest two brothers show up less frequently. And now let's skip Fang and just get to Kai. As you can see, Kai A contains a lot of subtle variations in the strokes. It gives us a strong sense of writing. That's also why its most used scenario is in children's books and in education, where kids or foreigners learn to read and write Chinese. Now, you know a little bit about both the four brothers in Chinese and the two genes of italics. If we are to marry Hanzi to italics, the major difficulty before us is the slanting gene, because Chinese traditionally rejects slanted Hanzi. Tradition has it that composing a Hanzi is just like building a house. It must look stable and squarish. It must stand. So we kind of have to give up the slanting gene now and switch to italics other identity, namely the running gene that gives the font liveliness. Before jumping into the specific design and of letter form or character shape, let's see, let's see to what could have been Chinese italics in history. Different from the Latin typographic practice, Chinese generally don't mix type in the same sentence. But historically, Chinese did use different fonts or script styles in a single book, achieving a similar function of italics in history to differentiate, differentiate information. For example, this is a woodblock book uh, on Islamic philosophy from the Qing dynasty. Uh, there, you see several distinctive styles are used for different preferences. There are totally 11 different preferences written by different people, the author, the editors, and other Chinese scholars. And I've singled out the same characters from the 11 prefaces, and you can tell the different styles. What's more, in this book, the printer also used the different fonts, uh, different fonts or script styles to, to tell the end notes from the main text. Such practice uh, persists until today, Song for main text and Kai for prefaces or comments. Let's turn to another more contemporary example. This is a page from the novel A Song, sorry, A Song of Ice and Fire. Anyone knows why there are some Kai inside the Song text? To repeat, Song is Chinese equivalent of Roman serif and Kai's educational handwriting style. Yes, the English original is in italic. Apparently, the Chinese translation even wants to be consistent in the layout. And the result, this text is in Song Kai mixture. Such typographic usage is an utter import. We can find a mixture of types like this in older translated books. For example, in this 1933 print of Robinson Crusoe, uh, circles or dots instead of italics are used to stress or differentiate. By the way, books then are written vertically. Back to the song of Ice and Fire, italics running gene suggests a sense of handwriting. So does Kai here. To take up the slot where it's supposed to be italics in the original English text, so you may start to get a hunch that in terms of functionality, Kai seems the perfect candidate for a mission of italicizing Chinese. It is a Chinese italic, isn't it? Like italic, it conveys a sense of writing and in complement song, it, uh, our Chinese Roman. Moreover, to mix that song and Kai is a common practice in Chinese typography today. However, let's give it a second look. When Kai and Song are placed together, it can get a bit strange. Imagine if you try to fix a chancery hand, 
two classic Roman typefaces. I can see this is the perfect analogy, but you get what I, what I mean. So and Kai may be not compat compatible after all. Kai may be just a little bit too organic, a bit too lovely for serious looking standard stone. It probably stands out too much in details compared to the contrast between italics and Roman. So it's time to introduce the third brother, Fang, also known as Fang Song. It is an early 20th century typeface that can be said to have shared origin with Kai. Like Kai, Fang's horizontal strokes are slightly slanted to top right. Fang and Kai also share more complex central area. And according to Yuji Koiso's research, the gravitational center of Kai and Fang is a little bit to the upper left compared to Song. This animation could give you a clearer idea. But unlike Kai, Fang has less organ organic curves and ob obviously fits better with Song if there was a Roman Italian kind of couple. But the problem now is if we take Fang for Italic Song. For convenience, I'm going to call the font of Italic size the Chinese Italic Song thereafter. If we take Fang for Italic Song, it will look a, a bit too similar in structures to be seen differently. In Latin, Italics work by breaking from the letter forms of Romans to make your eyes stop. But Fang and Song are too homogeneous in their character shape to get this effect. How do you feel? Yeah, uh, in Latin, Roma and Italic are a couple, meaning that they speak to each other in the same design language. But just as I said before, no Song, Kai, or Fang, no Chinese font styles have ever been designed as a whole and uh, the category, category of the type family. In the history of Chinese type design, the brothers have never been a family. And this is what I'm going to do now. If we are going to take Song for Chinese equivalent for the Latin Roman, then the job now is to design a face called Italian Song on the basis of Feng or Kai with the running gene of italics and then make it match, match the song typeface for our choice, outstandingly. Solution, let's amplify Kai and Fang's special features, smaller central area, higher center, and slightly horizontal strokes. Let's make them louder. Let the Italian song stand out the song context. So here we go. We have Italic as a song. The Italic song and the song now look just like Roman and Italic. How do you feel it? Okay, you guys, you guys may not get what I'm doing. Yes, I admit the difference is subtle. So let's turn to another direction. What about Italic's other gene, the slanting gene? that uh, we gave up earlier. Earlier I mentioned that Chinese traditionally rejects slanted hanzi, but most people in China, even type designers, can't really explain why. They only repeat the old saying that hanzi can't be slant slanted. Kids are also told to write square. Remember the building metaphor I've said before? Nobody wants to see the building collapse. But will the building collapse? <laughs> this is a diagram by tap designer Toshi Omagali. As I've said before, and Toshi here also tried to prove even Latin letters, italics are not just about slanting. It's Latin italics also have to stand firm. Julius Hui, who used to work in monotype Hong Kong, had a 
once famously said slanting hands is impossible. And a couple of years later, he worked for Chinese tech giant Tencent to produce a costume typeface. It's slanted. He made a lot of adjustments in details to save the building from collapsing. At least this proves that it is entirely possible to produce slanted hands that stand still. So why? Why on earth can't we have slanted hands? Why does the, the idea that hands can be slanted run so deep in Chinese mind? Because traditionally, hands were written and set vertically. So let's take a look at different writing systems, Latin, Arabic, and Chinese. It's interesting to find that with writing, the slanting direction is related to the different writing orientations. So as we know, italics were born of fast continuous writing, and in traditional Chinese cursive calligraphy, we can also see the corresponding features of italics, though vertically. In Chinese calligraphy, the vertical strokes almost never slump. So as to ensure a nice continuous flow of characters, and calligraphers even have a saying called xuan zhen shu, that meaning uh, that the vertical stroke should be as vertical as a hanging needle. So it turns out that vertical strokes are extremely important in its stabilizing a script that says vertically. So it makes sense not to slam the glyphs. This is why the idea of slanting Chinese meets so much resistance from the script users. However, here comes another problem. In mainland China, Hanzi is no longer written or set vertically. In the early 20th century, Chinese intellectuals and the Western influences began to think about changing the orientation of Chinese writing and typesetting. They wrote all sorts of essays trying to prove that the vertical Chinese inferior to horizontal Latin, Latin and harms reading efficiency. A horizontal setting and writing rule would be better for Chinese. Well, most of them don't have much proof this was more a cultural and a political choice. True, horizontal setting is better for mass formulas or borrowed Latin words, which would be unavoidable used in occasions related to science, and that's also why science became the first horizontally set magazine in China. But at that time, it was not a common practice. And after the People's Republic of China was, born, was founded in 1949, the government forced this transition from vertical to horizontal. In January the 1st, 1955, Guangming Daily, the state newspaper, changed the horizontal setting, and uh, many presses in China followed suit. One year later, on the first day of 1956, People's Daily, the party newspaper, they also changed the horizontal setting, which marked the start of the transition. It sets the rule that all publications in China should be set horizontally, with only very few exceptions. So the basic typograph typographic rule changed within just one year and the political call, but font, font styles didn't change for that, nor how people learn to write. We can still find clues in history. This is China's first premier, Zhou Enlai's handwriting, before and after the transition. Before, he wrote vertically, and you see a slanting direction is to the upper right. And after that, he wrote horizontally. As you see, he began to slant Chinese just as Latin italics. Frankly speaking, his handwriting is a rare case most of the calligraphers would still write vertically today. It's really hard to locate examples of horizontal cursive handwriting because the transition just happened no more than 70 years ago. Most people are taught, are taught to follow the traditional vertical writing rules 
that forbid slanting. And another more important reason may be with uh, cell phones and computers, people hardly write anymore. Instead, they type and use fonts, which still follow the rules of the last century and stand upright. Today, writing has less influence on changing a script style. So now, let's do an even bolder thought experiment. If we destroy all the cell phones, all the computers, and all metal types, and if we forget everything about printing and abandon all the previous writing principles, just start to write Chinese horizontally, like most people already do today. It won't take a long time. I think maybe 100 years is enough, or even less. In 2119, we will have a form of Chinese italics naturally, just like how the italic script came into being in the Renaissance. A horizontal cursive Chinese style could dominate the literary world. Then, if we reinvent the printing technology, and there would be italic Chinese type by default. That's, that's it. And someone will give a talk about the history of this Italian song in BIS 109. <laughs> cool. So the idea is I don't think we have to consider slanted hands a taboo, but we should also uh, follow the tradition. We shouldn't make it too carelessly either. We need to educate, we need educated and informed design. And we don't have to wait for the 22nd century uh, to give us italicized Chinese. Let's do it right away. Good designers don't wait for the trends, uh, but they invent them, right? So now just imagine that Chinese wasn't written vertically, but horizontally for a long time. We don't need new needles as the guidelines that continuous reading flow. Instead, Maybe we need shooting needles. Yes, and the song, Italian song mixture would be like this. And this is Italian song compared to mathematically slanted song. See the difference? Yes, I have given the same talk in Chinese twice. And one of the most critical responses I've received is that the whole Italic Chinese, Chinese thing is nonsensical. Hanzi doesn't need to be italicized. And my experiments show exactly the Latin aesthetic hegemony in Tap world. My answer is no. I think this is a meaningful experiment. And the more important thing I'm trying to prove here is that modern Chinese typography is still very young, though its art of writing is old. And we should indeed do things without being too sensitive about cultural implications. The thing is, when we do cross-cultural designs, we can never go for the cultural egalitarianism. Scripts are different, and we, have to be, we, we don't have to be single-minded about them. There are still a lot of possibilities to experiment and to play with Chinese. Habits may set seemingly impassable boundaries, but as designers, we should make differences. So that's all. Thank you for listening. I'm really from 3Tap, and have a nice day. Thank you, Willie.